you are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. And we are here in this segment with Kara St. Louis, the researcher, author, um, and experiencer of uh, what we're going to call, you know, here's the thing. We've talked about alternative history. Well, guess what? What you have lived in in your conscious lifetime is alternative history because they altered it. So today we're going to start digging into the roots of real history the real origins of humanity, how timelines have been altered, social engineering has been deployed to basically keep us ignorant of the roots of humanity, and even better, the potential of humans to advance beyond our present state. I welcome show Kara St. Louis. Welcome back to Off Planet TV. It's good to hey, be thanks. Back. Thank you, Randy. I am so glad to talk to you. I haven't talked to you since last summer, and that was in Maine, and now I'm in London, and and, you know, um, I wonder if you would agree if I said the time between last July and now has been kind of staggering um, for you and I, you and I both, you and I have sort of similar um, kind patterns of and things coming at us all the time. And we have similar, a similar awakening path and things like that. But that's, that's one of the reasons when I have something well, that's something that's got your name all over it. <laughs> you, do, you, do. you did with this. <laughs> this is the bomb. Um, yeah. Your current work, which um, it really extends off of Dangerous Imaginations, is now a workbook, but you've done yeah. something very innovative. Well, yeah, at the suggestion of a fellow called Duncan Rhodes, which everybody everybody knows who Duncan is, even if you don't know him. Um, when I first came out with Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation, which I wrote with Harold Kautzbella, whom I am no longer associated with, but the book is still a crackerjack book. The book's no different than it ever was. Um, Duncan read it. And he was in the midst of making massive transitions uh, with his magazine and with websites and things like that. And he said to me that that particular book was really a prime candidate for serialization. I should really think about doing that. However, Randy, as you know, that book was written for two parts to go together so that it would be a no excuses book. It was the, the how and the why and the what all together. And, um, so taking those things apart didn't make any sense at all. However, now that I'm working on the next piece of what is actually going to be a trilogy, the Imagination Chronicles, this is the rest of it's all mine. Yes. The second part is part is called the workbook. And it really will have probably 10 or 12 pieces, which I actually am calling episodes. And I'm calling them that because that's a literary term that's been hijacked. I'm just taking it back. It is a literary I'm, term. It actually it means the word epi. Yeah. So um, units of writings. The yeah, see, I'm just so, I mean, it's, it's, I'm the, I am the anarchy channel right now, just like you are. It's, the all, it's all anarchy now because why not, right? Um, anyway, so, so there will probably be 10 or 12 episodes. And in the end, the, book, the workbook will end up being between five and 600 pages long. It's going to take me a while to get all that together. And each one of the episodes is really quite, they all go together because of the world we live in. But they're also standalone. And I'm trying to get, get each of them out independently. So um, the first one is actually out. It's been out for a few weeks now. It's called False History, The Great Remembering. But as I talk about this particular piece, I realize that I also could conceivably call it the real Game of Thrones because in the end, 
what's happened is our, I mean, the bottom line is our history and our chronology and our timeline was hijacked to justify the ruling elite that's in place right now, the monarchies around the globe. Um, but that's kind of jumping ahead of, of what I want to talk about. Um, so there's that. And I do want to talk, I want to talk about that a bit. I want to tell you that the, the episode, which you, you have, have you had a chance to read any of it? Cause it's just been a few hours that you've had it. Yeah, I, I downloaded it and I kind of skipped through it. So I got it's okay. You've just had it for a few hours. Yeah. And um, what it is, is 50 or 60 pages of my doing what I do, which is try to make things readable for everybody. You don't have to be an astronomer. You don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be anything except somebody who's paying attention hopefully with my work. And so 50 or 60 pages has distilled in a way my research, which my, and my research covered about 42 videos, Randy, and 2000 pages of reading and more since then. So what I tell people is the workbook is a thing that you, it's a, it's a, a tool. You read it and then you either want to know more and you do your own work, which you should anyway, or you're satisfied with, with what I put in front of you and you move on to another episode. Well, um, I, if I can just interject, in, yeah. in a sense, what you've done is this is a collaboration between author and readers. And yeah. here's the thing, for too long, the so-called, again, alternative, but it's not really research community has largely been passive. It's been people who consumed a lot of data, a lot of research, and then regurgitated it back out without actually doing the wet work that's required to do this. Yeah. You sort of challenge people now to be collaborators in terms of exploring the material that you're putting out, which I like, because yeah. it's proactive. It forced, when you engage something, you then actually become a creator rather than passively sitting there consuming media, which is exactly what we've been trained to do our entire yeah. lives. Yeah, I don't want people to be passive anymore, yeah. if it's at all possible. I mean, this is a big challenge because we're trained to be that way. The other thing that I'm sort of bound and determined to have happen is a lot of, some of it's primary research because it's my research, but a lot of it is just bringing a couple of people to the fore who absolutely deserve to be seen, heard, and recognized, you know? And um, the other thing that really, really upsets me, and it's happened to, you know, is, oh, the alternative community. <laughs> they sideswipe each other all the time. And I don't think that's okay anymore. I think that there's room at the table for everybody, including everybody who's reading all this work. And um, I don't think it's okay. I mean, Ike was, the, was Ike is a really good example. I use Ike as, as an example because I like, I like Ike and I worked for Ike. Ike's a good enough guy, you know what I mean? But yes. he's also a snake oil salesman and he stole word for word everything John Coleman ever wrote. And then he just put it in books and he put his name on it and he started selling it. You should hear John Coleman on that subject. Oh my God. I heard John Coleman. <laughs> and, and truthfully, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of what we have in, 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 again in the alternative community. It's yep. this huge clash of egos rather than overlaying yes. the work of other people. Well, and you know, it isn't just that before we move back into the material, it's also, there have been a couple of times, uh, one I'm thinking of in particular, although this guy I just told you about might be another example of the same thing, but I'm not going to name any names, but let me tell you a story. Okay. When I ended up having to leave the United States because I just couldn't get my work out and I came to London and it was serendipity, I mean, it wasn't serendipity, you know, I don't believe in accidents, but once I was in London, all of a sudden I could get my work out and I could do that because all information flows out of London. Nothing stops it because they're doing business here and they want, this is one of the three major points of the spider web and they want, you know, there's just nothing that stops information from coming from here because they're doing their work. So I can surf that, you know, stream. And so they really don't stop me from getting my work out. And so it's been since I came to London that I've been able to get that stuff back into the U.S., for example, talking to you where you, where you are. Um, I couldn't, 
you know, I just couldn't get out from being buried in the States because that's what's up in the States. It's information lockdown. It's an electromagnetic prison camp. It's all of those things still. Um, and the same is true in Australia. So, but here's a phenomenon that, that keeps happening. And now I'm, yeah, there's a couple of things I want to say. Now I'm recognizing it because I've been around long enough to see it. And it is bizarre. And it's coming from either AI or the government or, you know, I don't know if those, those two things are probably interchangeable at a big level. But when I left, you know, what, who am I? I am basically... I'm from the American Southwest. I'm from New Mexico. I never make any bones about the fact that I'm a Waldorf teacher. Over here, we call them Steiner teachers. I mean, this is just my background, right? No sooner had I left the country than lo and behold, all of a sudden pops up this activist, this chemtrail activist who's from New Mexico and is a former Waldorf teacher. And I went, wow, that's a coincidence. Isn't that interesting? Didn't really think anything of it until that same person tried to hijack the comment section under one of my basis interviews by posting their own work and a bunch of other people's work. And I was like, yeah. what is happening? And I thought, you know, okay, so basically what, you know, it occurred to me at the time that, you know, the powers that be will then re sort of recreate a persona and deliver the same material, but the way they want it delivered. Do you know what I'm saying? So this keeps happening. It's almost like all of a sudden you'll see a doppelganger of some sort. One of, and, and, and also want to, I want to say this because, and you can listeners make up your own minds, but I will say that two of the sources that I use for my book are a woman who puts out a tremendous amount of good work. Um, on a YouTube site called New Earth. I might have even mentioned it to you before. It's N-E-W-E-A-R-T-H, but she uses it as one word. And it's the Survivor Series, okay? It's got like 42 videos. And this is what first clued, started to clue me in as to the chronology and the errors. You know, obviously, I'm not the first one to come up with this stuff. The person, you know, the first person I've been able to come up with who recognized the errors in the chronology was... Um, Isaac Newton. People, I know Isaac Newton had his issues, and I know that he was probably a Mason and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is he was also a master chronologer, and for some reason he felt it was necessary to publish a book right before he died that pointed out the massive flaws in the timeline. He, he just got one book out before he died. Anyway, so like I said, I'm not the only one who's coming up with this material. But Sophia, no, Sylvia Ivanova is her name. She lives near Vienna somewhere, and I've been in contact with her, obviously. I'd love to interview her, but she is somebody who puts out a tremendous amount of work but doesn't really want a persona. Mm. She doesn't. She gives interviews, if you're interested, but she doesn't want her face on the front of the Wheaties box, you know? And I understand that. Um, anyway, so... A couple days ago, I went in to look at one particular piece of one piece in particular, and I thought I was clicking something that was hers, and I ended up clicking something very, very similar. So similar that I just even I, who really dig this chick, clicked this other thing. And it's called um, Forbidden Archaeology, is the name of the site. Right. Same exact topic in this one thing that I was trying to look up very well um, laid out in terms of how, you you know, it was explained in a really groovy voiceover. Uh, Sylvia is Slavic and it can be very difficult to understand her. And she knows that. Um, and but but the spin on this story was the globalist. It was massaging the whole story to support the globalist agenda. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Look at that. So you have to be very, very careful because, wow, are they right on our butts here producing? Well, no, this is the strategy behind the social media explosion. We know, yeah. for instance, that the NSA, the CIA, Langley have all hired bloggers. They've hired people to go out and post links and basically to create chaos. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. they, they can no longer suppress the knowledge. So what they've done is they've created diffusion. They basically yeah. created this, this cloud in which the unawares have to go out there and somehow 
pluck out of this this massive trove of data and videos and online right. blogs um, the actual information. And I've had this conversation with a number of my friends in the media, and we've went, you know, 90% of what's on the internet right now is crap. It is yeah. thrown there. It is misinformation, disinformation. It's designed to take you not down the rabbit hole per se, but right. rabbit holes that go into other rabbit holes that take you into a central corridor they want you to travel. All right. So be careful out there. Yeah. Be aware. I'm telling you that the original, the one that grabbed me is New Earth and it's on YouTube. And uh, the woman is a slob, but and she's because she'd be a little difficult to listen to. But she's the real deal. OK, and start at number one. Because I've got people telling me, oh, I started at like number 96 and that's way out in the, and it's just, you know, no, don't do that. Anyway, so I'm going to back up a little bit because there are two, like I said, there are two um, researchers that I'm relying on right now. The other one's name is Anatoly Fomenko. And at this point in time, people might, that name might actually be getting some traction because a lot of us are talking about Fomenko. And he's put out a series of history, fact or fiction, I think. Um, He's Russian, okay, he's a mathematician and an astronomer, and he's at Moscow University, and at this point in his life, he's, he's been doing this for a long time, like since 1973, maybe, although he, he doesn't appear to be elderly or anything, you know, he's a fairly robust, youngish sort of chap. Um, but he's got a cadre of research with, researchers with him now working on the same thing, probably a hundred strong or better who are all top-notch scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, and importantly, astronomers at universities in Moscow. And um, let me just make the statement because I don't think you, you kind of made it for me, but let me, let me start by making the statement that there is such a thing as, okay, there is such a thing as history. We are taught history in these indoctrination camps we call schools. And we know have known for a decade or better, 20, 30 years since Vietnam came around or since Kennedy was killed, really, that history is spun just beyond belief. It's uh, it's spun over and over and over again, and it is conjured to support whatever the agenda is of the people who are treating us like herds, hurting us this way and hurting us that way. They even try that. to do with something as recent as 9-11. Yeah, See, I'm this, is where, yeah. this is where where we'll call them the cabal, mm, okay. whatever, whatever you want to call them. This is where the wheels start to come off the cart because 9-11 was one of those pivotal events that occurred in the window of this human awakening that we're going Yes, through. yes. So they've had a real difficult time, but they've done a hell of a good job. They've yeah. pitted all the researchers against each other with various theories. Right. That continue to just disseminate out into the webosphere, creating this mm -hmm. cloud from mm -hmm. which they'll eventually find some alternative stream of history to spin 9-11. But yeah. so far, at least we're maintaining the truth thing. I didn't mean to disrupt you. No, that's okay. And, and actually, you're right about that. Um, and, and because of the phenomenon that you're describing right now, that's why these uh, invasions clunk to our feet in a way uh we didn't go into syria we didn't do this we didn't do that the germans wouldn't cooperate i was actually in germany near heidelberg uh when obama was trying to get germany to be the first you know the, the point of the spear into syria i think it was and i i literally that day thought i might actually die from drowning with what they were chemming those people with that day i've never seen it that bad before but germany didn't cave that time they didn't cave that time unfortunately merkel has you know i mean they've they've caved in the in the immigration or the refugee thing which you know i don't want to get into that because that's a completely different story but um, so there is history and there is, we all know that it's not, I think we're all, we're all pretty well aware that it's not really kosher. It's not really the straight story. However, um, there is this thing called the chronology and the best way to describe that is that it's the timeline that we all use. Everybody's familiar with timeline from, from school, you know, um, and it is important in the sense that very often 
wars or dynasties or any uh, a geopolitical action of some sort will be justified based on data in the timeline that somehow proves that uh, what's about to happen or what just happened was justified or or maybe even not justified based on, you know, they use it to justify human act, geopolitical action right now. Yeah. Okay. So the reality is, though, that it's uh, the problem with it is, though, that it's a com it's complete bollocks. It's an absolute it's absolute bullshit. Okay. There has been a minimum of an extra thousand years inserted into our timeline. Flamenco points out that it's probably far more likely three hundred than a thousand than twelve hundred. I mean, we have absolutely no idea what the date is. And um, there are many, many historians through time, including Johannes Kepler, who've known that it's incorrect. How did they know it's incorrect? Well, they knew it was incorrect because we keep track of history and important events in a lovely, beautiful way. We do it via astronomy. We do it via constellations and their positions in the sky, which we can regularly count on. We do it via... Uh, um, comets that come by regularly and eclipses, particularly lunar and solar eclipses that are predictable and that we knew know occur based on, you know, trigonometry. The, the astronomy essentially at its most base is trigonometry. It's not it's not um, astrophysics. It's not, you know, it's it's a very simple, very old, very ancient sort of dependable way that we keep track of time. Now Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, Oswald Spengler, the list is long of the historians who absolutely knew that there was something wrong with the timeline um, and tried to say things about it. Johannes Kepler is very famous within these circles for having said, Scaliger, who I haven't even mentioned yet, he's the guy who invented you know, this particular timeline, has seduced me. It's terrifying to study the chron chronology. Uh, because he knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two things. Here's what happened. In the 16th century, there was a guy called Joseph, Joseph Scaliger. He styled himself Josephus Scaligarius because everybody sort of did that. Uh, they wanted to Latinize everything that they, everything about themselves because it made them seem smarter, more academic, and more um, um, what? Well, anyway, um, anyway, he got a hold of some original documents, it appears, and the timeline that existed, and he started changing it. He started going to town on it. Some people will say he started refining it, but the reality is Scaliger was a Jesuit, and, and I've got, this is sort of complex, so this is one of the reasons I put this together in the episode because it's it can be quite difficult to talk about to, to hold this in your head scalier was a jesuit and he and this fellow dennis patau who styled himself dionysius patavius along with a cadre of benedictine monks took the chronology that was in existence and they changed it and they changed it to suit the jesuits which is not, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who is digging around in the alternative world because the Jesuits are just sort of everywhere. Okay, so it's important to note that any original documents that the man used, assuming they were original at all anyway, no longer exist. There are no original documents existent to back up any of his data. And those that we know about that he claims to have used have all that's 100%, Randy, perished in fire, in a library, in somebody's house. Like the uh, Alexandrian Library, which... Exactly. In the, and then all of this other extant data gets hoovered up into the vaults of the Vatican. Right. There's, yes. The yes. there's no way to check the, the truth of no. the chronology. And we just accept it. We just accept it because most... Human beings alive in this time and space wouldn't, I mean, why would we bother to, to adapt it, to change a chronology? Well, this period of a thousand years um, between, well, 
before 14, before 16, let's just say before the 16th century. Okay. Because that's when, that's when Scaliger was at work. Let's just say that. Although all of the data is clearly delineated in my episode. Um, it's all completely made up. It's all completely contrived. And in fact, the reality is based on astronomical data, such things as uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, should you accept the fact that he was a man who roamed the earth? And I, and I actually think that's just as likely as anything else was a medieval character. That man did that, that persona did not arrive based on the astronomical data that's described as having been apparent at the time of his birth until the middle ages. This is the middle. This is what you want to call the middle ages. I mean, the dark ages, the, the dark ages, by the way, is a good description of what this chunk of time that was invented by Scaliger, the dark ages between about 900 AD and the 16th century. Okay. That's the biggest, most uh, lie filled portion of the Chronicle. Now, how was this discovered to be wrong? Well, there, other than the fellows, the historians and astronomers I've already talked about, there was a fellow in Russia called Morozov, Morozov, and he, up until about 1923, was working on this problem. And he was working on this problem because he discovered an anomaly with the way the moon behaved during that period of time. In order for there to be that much time and those many, that many events in that period of time, the moon would have had to gone bananas and just, you know, some, there's a big anomaly with the, the way the moon reacted during that period of time. Again, this is something I try to explain in the episode in very understandable terms, okay, because it's, you know, it can be obfuscated and then you're like, okay, right, I don't know, but it can also be easily understood. Morozov discovered that if you just remove some portions, if you remove some portions of time, the moon, you know, just straightened itself right on out. Okay, so what's more plausible, Randy? Is it more plausible that the moon lost its mind for several hundred years and then stopped losing and then just settled right back down? Or is it more plausible that there might be even some mistakes in the chronology, even understandable mistakes? let alone some, some you know, uh, deliberate insertion of time. Um, it's actually more likely that there are some mistakes in, the, in what amounts to a calendar of keeping track of time. So that's, that's how... Also, you're talking about pivots on a central fact of this Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Has been, and, and, and that's not an insignificant matter because that, no. they've, they've obscured themselves. They have basically created this artifice around themselves that seems to indicate there were, as you point out in your writings, two Roman empires when in fact it appears as though all of that was a fabrication. Yeah, exactly. There was, there was, there was a Rome. In fact, you're right about Rome. We do need to, that's the first place I went to because so much of everything that we are is based on Rome and that our understanding and belief of what Rome was, what, how, you know, mar they marched across the world and they captured, you know, all of the things that we consider to be Roman, the justice system, the Republic, everything. Okay. Our modern world is very much predicated on that. Now they will say in the chronology that there were three Roman empires, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Okay. The question is when, okay, well, there are two questions. Were there three Roman empires? Number one. And two, when was it? The reality is, Yes, there was a Roman Empire. It's not nearly what we think it was, okay? Um, first of all, and we're much closer to Rome, Greece, and even Atlantis than, we, than they tell us, than they allow us to be. The survivors of Atlantis really were roaming this planet up to a few centuries ago, it, and they probably still are. We just don't know where they are. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, Rome, one, two, and three, Rome was, was actually founded right on the heels of Troy. And in fact, Troy was an Italian city. It, that happened in Italy. And it's far more likely that Rome was founded by one of the sons of Ulysses. There was no, there was no such person as Aeneas. There were no such people as Romulus and Ramus. That's all bullshit. That is all sort of there to then lead us down a different path. Now, one of the things Fomenko did 
was, uh, he's a master statistician. So he created a form, he called it a dynasty form, I think. And there were 35 or 40 uh, points of consideration when he was looking at one dynasty to the next dynasty to the next dynasty. And as he compared one to the next, to the next, to the next, they literally overlapped each other. He got some, he got graphs out of this, this data and they were point for point for point for point for point, the same freaking dynasty, which one of the, and one of the things that that means is he's proved, I mean, this, the odds are a hundred billion to one that he's wrong statistically, in my opinion, that means he's proved it, that the third Roman dynasty and the dynasty of Jerusalem with Jeroboam at the head of it was exactly the same dynasty. And somehow that leads me to be able to, what I'm thinking about right now is one of the other things, one of, one of the points of research for me when I was doing dangerous imagination was this idea that the Prussian, that Wilhelm II, the original uh, Prussian emperor had himself declared the king of Jerusalem, and I never could figure out why he would do that. But if it was, do you see how those things can 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 go together? I just haven't quite come up with the words. No, they're to interwoven. That. This is yeah. all interwoven. Somehow Jerusalem gets interwoven into Rome in this weird kind of way that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. The right. thing is, you know, and I don't know if you've looked at this or not. We have problems with timelines on the Egyptian side where we can't yeah. we keep finding more kings than there were yes. Yes. periods for kings. Yes, we have, that's the thing. Then we have picture in the West completely of any history of China, China which yes. is now slowly starting to emerge. But China comes from behind this wall and we don't understand the overlap. The only thing we really have there as an anchor is Marco Polo. That's it. The westernized yeah. version of Eastern history. Yes. It creates a vacuum into which they've dumped all this garbage to create these aberrant timelines and these aberrant chronologies. Yes. I know that Egypt is thousands and thousands of years closer to us than they tell us. That's which does not. See, that's the thing. That's where the truth sandwich comes in. Yes, there are Egyptologists out there who are discovering that man has been on this planet for millennia longer than they say. But that does not mean that Egypt, Egypt, the Egypt that we study, the civilization they want us to think is Egypt is not much closer to us. Those are two separate things. It's much closer to us than we think it is. The other thing is Rome is very close to us and Atlantis. And you did bring up China. I will tell you that Flamenco, <laughs> Flamenco's work indicates that the Chinese, the Great Wall of China is only a few hundred years old. Okay, there's a huge deception going on there. Um, I don't know what the original, what the actual Chinese history is. I don't think we know what the actual Chinese know. history that's, is. That's the frustrating part of it. We don't yeah, know. No idea because there's this big modern overlay and that comes during this period of a thousand years that I've already mentioned. All of a sudden dynasties started to appear out of nowhere that no one had ever heard of before. Okay, and I've listed some of those in the um, episode as well. It's difficult right now. There's so much research for me to keep all of this. Yeah. Once I've lectured on this for about six months, I'll be able to rattle it all off. But right now I'm relying on the writing that I did. I put it down so that everybody could see what it was that I found. Um, so, yes, the, we don't know the Chinese history. We know I know that there are many, many um, uh, dynasties in place right now that can tr that trace their authenticity and their right to rule back to this fake thousand years and we're dealing with an entity we're dealing with the predator here who thinks in terms of centuries and putting things in place we don't think in terms of centuries we especially not now after the 20th century when we've been taught to think in no, 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 no. we're being shrunk constantly now in terms yeah. of consciousness i, I just said exactly. I had a conversation with a friend of mine last night and i said the the, in, the insanity of this technology is it's shrinking human consciousness now yeah. down not into chunks of years or months or days and literally so yeah. we focus we're as a culture becoming massively attention deficit disorder. It's true. And one of the things that's really important, um, this is why, I mean, I know I've, I've had a couple of, uh, a 
conversations where people have said, have asked me, okay, so why do we care about the fact that history, I mean, we know history is bullshit, but why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because this is how our slave masters have justified their reign over us, number one, and it's crap. Number two, the, the people who are using, the people right now who are bringing this to light, that it's, that it's a a big, I mean, it's a huge lie. And I'm from one, I'm sick of being lied to. I'm sick of living in their, their, um, hologram for God's sake. Okay. I, and, um, that they're using supercomputing to prove that this chronology is wrong, but guess what? The other side's using supercomputing to close the gaps and it won't be very long before we can't, we can't, we don't have any daylight in terms of seeing what this is and 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 getting away from it and and busting it wide open so it really is very important that we talk we're about speaking about daylight metaphorically there but we're also talking about daylight literally yeah we are the solar dimming the yeah. heart the chemtrails and all that's going on all of this, this is related as you you actually managed to execute a number of hairpin turns even in this first episode yeah thing, things that go back to your earlier books yes obviously goes back to this this whole pivot experience you had with you know the death yeah. of your mother yeah she and i had an agreement when we came here this is what we were going to do yeah. and she knew she was going to die and she knew she was going to die that way I promise you she knew she was going to die that way. I mean, I could, I could talk for 10 minutes about the hints that she gave me and herself that, you know, let me know that that was going to happen. And she also knew damn well that I was going to write about it, that I was going to see it and I was going to write about it. And basically this is, this is where like bookends, this is what we came into here to do. Um, Yes. So yes, it, it does go back to chemtrails for, for lots of reasons. And um, I do have to say that one of, the, <laughs> one of the reasons, you know, if you have a comment section enabled for this, this is, this is where you're going to get slammed. And this is where I'm going to get slammed. It goes back to the flat earth stuff. Okay. For one thing. Oh, All right. Yeah. Okay. First of all, they're pushing us back to 2D because if you've spent your whole life staring at a screen, a screen is nice and flat, right? And we're coming back. They're trying to bring us back down from 3D, 4D, 5D. We should be going up to 5. Well, we can anytime we want to. That's who we are. Um, however, the the flat. If you have a, if you have a significant portion of people who can make a loud enough noise about the chronology and how bullshit it is. And, and am I cursing too much, by the way? You're going to be able to show this anyway. No, no you haven't um, dropped any F bombs yet. So, okay. Well, okay. okay. No, no, I, this, is, okay. this is natural human conversation. It is natural human conversation. Yes. Um, if you have enough people and it looks like that might, that argument might be getting some daylight, then what better thing, what is job one other than to discredit normal, common astronomy, spherical astronomy, because if we're using that to say, hey, look, here's the proof. Well, first thing you're going to try to do is discredit that proof, the proof giving, you know, mechanism. And, and the reality is astronomy and the mathematics and the statistics that are being used to prove that the chronology is false are the science that people can be comfy with. You know, I can come and I can say, I just feel like this is, I have, I have a knowing that this is wrong. Well, people will listen to me, but that will not uh, resonate with many of people as proof. Okay. What well, we've been taught to have resonate with us as proof are maths and astronomy and statistics and all of that. The things that we can now use their weapons well, they're not really weapons. They're beautiful phenomenon, uh, astronomy in particular. But, of course, that's the first thing they're going to try to drag down and um, for lots and lots of reasons. So anytime I lecture, and I've got several lectures planned for the year, I'm going to actually preface it by saying I'm not here to argue the toss about flat earth. I'm not going to do it because it is the single most divisive thing I've seen come up in a very long time. You know, this was this this destroyed entire communities. It created it did. massive amounts of cognitive dissonance. I fell into oh, it too. Yeah. I mean, did I entertained you? it. Um, well, only, I mean, you know, you look at it, right? Well, only from the standpoint of speculation. 
I yeah, was willing of to engage the arguments for the sake uh-huh. of gaining some understanding on it. I mean, right. I'm not a scientist. I don't have a great understanding of astronomy and, you know, all of the spherical aspects of things. If you look at where we live, you look, right. well, we're walking around on a planet. I don't feel a curvature. And I got to tell you, some of the science doesn't work. So we have problems, but a lot of it does. And some of it is because, again, there's this distortion. I actually heard your husband, Joshka, say this in a basis yeah. lecture when he was oh, yeah. talking about weather patterns. Yeah, yeah. And he dropped that little bonbon in there very nicely. And I went, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. That's an interesting factoid. Thank you, Joshka, yeah. for putting that in there. Because yeah. even if we pulled back from the abyss where we're just going, yeah. oh, it's a flat earth and it's all a conspiracy and, and everything now is fucked when in fact what we can really do is work back from our reality stream right claim legitimate science legitimate history rather than going off the deep edge that we've been right by i will say some very well paid uh disinformation agents out there yeah yeah i mean there's a lot going on about that and and this even though this would be something of a departure for me because it's History is, is one thing, but the fact that this is backed up, and I, and I quite like astronomy, that's that's not, you know, and, and frankly, astrology and all of those things, and that's the other thing, that's the other thing you have to bear in mind. You know, billionaires rely on our, our astrology, yes. they will tell you that themselves, and that is spherical, and that is all about rising and setting. The, the, on Christmas Day, the Pope goes out on his balcony and waits for Orion to rise above the horizon down that path in his vision. That is his, uh, that's his alchemy right there. That's his, you know, this his sorcery. That's going on while he's delivering. How do you think they have the obelisk sitting in the middle of St. Uh, exactly. You know, the- exactly. But if they can prove that wrong and we lose contact with that information and that knowledge, then we don't get to use it anymore. They do. You see what's happening. They're just cutting us off from information. And chemtrails, if we can't see the sky... If we can't, I mean, it's just so, okay, I mean, there's just not enough time in the day to talk about the jobs that Kemminga is doing for the predator and against us. But that's one of the things that's going on. And also, uh, speaking of Yashka, he was studying Victor Schauberger recently very deeply. And Schauberger apparently had a lot of traffic with Rudolf Scheiner. He's, he's, that's where I come from. Um, and you know, uh, Steiner used to say, and, and, and it scared the hell out of me, I try not to think about this, but he did say that there will come a time when we can only see in black and white. I hate that idea. I just hate that idea. But he was very prescient, and he talked about the web that would cover the planet shortly and all this other stuff. Schalberger says we can't see unless there's an atmosphere in which to see. I and mean, we have to have an, human beings have to have an atmosphere. That's absolutely true. Yes. That's yes. true. Colors and everything. Oh, you got everything. Yeah. But if they're changing the plasma, if they're changing the atmosphere that we walk around in, they're changing what we can see and how we see it. Absolutely. They are. If it changes at all, they're changing how we can see. All right. So there, yeah. that's just, you know, there are just a couple of ways. It all starts and ends, I think, with chemtrails. And people will say, well, like I said before, people will say, why do I have to care about this history stuff? Well, all right, don't. But let me tell you something. They're coming us is connected to that. And while you may not see this history stuff as life or death, you better, you damn well better, well better see the chemtrails as life or death. Because that's actually what's happening there. And part of it is that agenda to change how we see, what we see, how we react to things. I just told Randy there's been a, uh, a major election here in London. The city, the city of London now has a new mayor. And we have just been drowning in chems the last few days. So it's all, everything goes to uh, chemtrails and directing us. And I I know you'll agree with this. We're dealing with a perceptual war here. Yeah, yeah. Dealing with our basic epistemology of how we perceive things and how we know things. Yeah, the perception is everything. You you talked about the plasma. They're altering the plasma up there in the sky, which is our environment, while at the same time giving us artificial plasma inside of these screens 
that yeah. we're communicating over, which is yeah. a hyper reality. It's a way to inject us into a virtual reality that then makes us containable in a virtual stream. Well, how archontic is that? Like, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Also, it's very, very important to understand if you're listening to this in the United States, that the chronology is being and has been for quite some time very aggressively challenged in the non-English speaking Europe and Russia, okay? That has been going on for a long time. That people, It's very aggressively challenged. There for okay, here's a good example of the kind of thing. It's coming out of Germany and Russia right now. The Germans are doing such good work, and I'm just very lucky that I've that I'm married to somebody who is uh, an obsessive researcher who translates this stuff for me so that I know. Um, but one of the things, for example, that Fomenko has put together is this idea of Rome. We talked about Rome and this idea of the Habsburg, Habsburg Dukes when they appeared on the scene was the Middle Ages. Yeah, but they actually go together. Caesar, Nero Caesar, Nero Caesar, you know, the one who fiddled while Rome burned, actually gave the Habsburg Dukes uh, privileges within Rome. So those those entities, those personalities, those political figures were actually concurrent. They happened at the same time. And there's a lot of data, uh, you know, colloquial uh, data and um, uh, just writings and um, which is a phenomena that, that, that indicates that the Habsburg dudes actually attended um, gladiator contests. These are, these are simultaneous occurrences. There's no time between those two things like we think there is. Mm. There just isn't. And in fact, a lot, a lot of what this does is very clearly and very uh, probably in legal terms eliminate Israel's claim to their, to their land because those are false dynasties and, and they come from someplace else. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of geopolitical ramifications to the fact that the, to the chronology is wrong. And, and thousands of years of building up a case to, to prove um, um, jurisdiction over territory that isn't theirs, whether it's the Windsors sitting in, uh, whether it's the Saxe Coburg Gotha sitting in Buckingham Palace, or whether it's, you know, the claims to the Israeli, to the Palestinian homeland, all of those sorts of things. And also what's going on right now is not only um, is, has the chronology been changed, but of course there have been uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of a dedicated effort to destroy any any uh, archaeological evidence to the contrary. Uh, it's why we went into Iraq. It's why we're going into Syria. Palmyra is a very important uh, source of archaeological evidence that proves the chronology is wrong. Even in Ukraine, there's a lot of, of archaeological evidence that proves that the chronology is wrong and uh, the predators. Well, it does appear that all of these places where we're waging war and specifically yeah. Iraq yeah. and Syria and places like this are also possessors of something that they want to possess. Why did they go right. and sack the Iraqi museum when, right. we, landed, when we landed there uh, to, to allegedly take out Saddam Hussein? Well, yeah. there, there is a war against history because some of these caches of, of knowledge have now been exposed. They're now coming up from the ground again. You know, I, I really, the earth helping us. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you can't suppress it. It's like what happened in 1947 with the Dead Sea Scrolls yeah. and how they began to reveal the truth about the scriptures that are called the Bible. Right. You know, obviously, they can corroborate some writings. And in other cases, you have the Gnostic writings, which occurred, which appeared to make case for um, the man called Jesus, we call Jesus, Issa, or Yeshua, being um, much more broad-based philosopher and mystic than the literal construct that was given to us by the religious structures of Rome. Yeah, by what, by what ended up being the Catholic Church. I mean, you right, can't exactly. just count. And it's all Catholic. All of all yeah. Christianity is Catholic. It's just variants that streamed yeah. off of it. So we have the so, same problem even there. 
Yes, and, and you have to understand that, you know, one of the most important events that happened in, in history, if you want to call it history, I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't use history to make any kind of argument anymore because it's, it, you just can't because it's all wrong. However, there was, there was supposedly this thing called the Council of Nicaea where they literally decided what story to tell. That's and then we ran with that's literally what happened. What story are we telling here, guys? Okay, great. Let's run with that. There was no such person as Charlemagne. There was no such person. I mean, you just keep going back. Constantinople and um, Constantine, that's actually sort of a mistranslation of a lot of words that were put, you know, to describe a phenomenon rather than a human being. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that we're talking about here. But, let, you know, one of the things I want to seg to, Yes. is um, this idea of the survivors of Atlantis, because that's something that you can look into on the New Earth, uh, w within the context of the New Earth research. And also it will be part of my research um, in the next episode, because the next episode is going to be dealing with something, a subject that Randy and I are both very fond of, both very connected to, and that is the, the, the um, subject of the Fae. And who are the Fae? And, and why are we, he and I, and probably, many, many other people all of a sudden bothered to pieces about this idea of the Fae because it's, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like right here and it's trying to, it's, tr it's knocking on our door and, and trying to find out what does that mean? And, and, and knowing and actually having, I don't know how Randy actually this occurred to him, but I know how it occurred to me. Um, and it isn't that long ago, but, you know, on some level, we're all awake all our lives. That's our higher self. Otherwise, there would nothing be nothing to reach. Absolutely. But in 2014, which was well into uh, this journey. By the way, Randy, do you realize it's only been four years since my house burned down? Wow. It's only been four years I've been on this. Look at the, I mean, just the world. Time's accelerating. <sighs> Things are moving very fast. Yeah. Worlds, worlds colliding. Yeah. yeah, that was that was March thirty first into April first, twenty twelve. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's quite a quite a train ride you're on. Damn. So October, mid October of twenty fourteen, I was in Leipzig with Harold doing a very very important interview for a guy called uh, Michael Vogt. And by the way, that interview has never been translated into German. That's where things started to kind of get weird with Harold, you know. I, I don't actually know. Well, we can talk about that later if you want to. It's fine. But um, anyway, we were coming back from Leipzig to Berlin, where he lives with his girlfriend still on a farm. And he asked me to come out to the farm to spend the night. And I, for some reason, said no. I, I didn't want to. It just didn't feel like a good idea. And I'm glad now. But um I said, I'm going to go to the hotel in Berlin. It's, you know, Schoen Schoenfeld, I think is the name of the airport. It's the cutest little airport you ever, you've ever seen. Few hotels right around it. It's because I'm never alone. So I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool. It'd be kind of nice to spend the evening on my own. So I did. And the next day I, I got up and I flew back to London. And then I realized once I got back to London that I had a blister. Have I said this to you already? Maybe I had a no, blister. No, I had, we actually I had a blister. glanced on this last year when we did the interview. Okay, I had a blister on each elbow, a blister on each knee, and I had this fingerprint bruise right over my heart. And uh, obviously, that, I found that to be suspicious. You know, I thought, what the hell? Where did that come from? A fingerprint. Anyway, so I contacted one of the initiates that I work with in the United States, and he said, well, they were just checking on you. I said, what do you mean they were just checking on me? What does that mean? He said, they were checking on you. These are energetic beings, right? And uh, someone put a hand right through your chest to check to see that your heart was okay. I said, all right, fine. Well, that that's because there's this massive protection around these kinds of things. Um, anyway, so the same initiate said, look, you are part of the Fae. You're part of the Fae. That's who you are. And I, and, and from, and that meant almost nothing to me because I had no information about that at all, but okay. Like so much in our lives, I parked it. Okay. Parked. But as I went along, it kept coming up. It kept coming up. You know, I would talk to Maria Wheatley and she said she'd seen, because it's not just 
The fey come from two directions, Randy. They come from out there and they come from up from the ground. They are wedded to this planet in ways that we, at least I don't yet understand. Okay, so they are both intra and interdimensional. And recently, <laughs> recently, I had one of the best discoveries of my life. Literally, sat down on the floor and cried because it addressed every post-it note I left on my body when I came. And that was that in Germany, there's this fellow called Erhard Landmann. And Erhard Landmann is a fellow who is this shy, retiring <laughs> IT guy who's very OCD and has done all of this research for decades and decades and decades. And he's put out books about it. And um, it's about the Fae and how they are on this planet and where they come from and how everything, every you know, so much of our language is, is about the Fae and they've left messages and they've left um They've left uh, clues for us to let us know that they were the original cedars of this planet, which I really do maintain that they were. Um, first of all, there's a planet. There's a planet. We, it's an open secret amongst some, in some circles. That planet is the bottom left-hand corner of the Big Dipper. They call it the plow here in England, and it is called, the planet is called Fecta, and it's spelled P-H-E-C-D-A, and that is where the Fae come from, okay? And they're in, in the Orlinda, Orlinda book and some other ancient manuscripts, there's like this, this path that leads you to the idea that that's where the Fae come from, this particular planet. They will tell you where you can locate it. Okay, and so I went and I located it and it's right there. And then I realized when I was looking into the Big Dipper that some people had done animations and this this constellation, which actually is not part of Ursa Major, it's right in front of Ursa Major, um, through the course of the year will appear to revolve around Polaris, the North Star. And as it revolves around Polaris, it forms a swastika. And as we know in the alternative community and other places. The swastika is one of the most ancient symbols on our planet. You can find it everywhere. It is now you can find it in things that you know are thousands and thousands and thousands of years. No, it goes, well, the earliest I've been able to find it goes back to ancient Hindu culture. However, yes. you define ancient, but it has its origins at least there in some respect that they were. Absolutely. Absolutely. For me personally, what it meant was having been born at the Four Corners, almost dead center in New Mexico, where the Hopi consider the swastika to be one of the most sacred symbols there is, and a symbol of great luck, and a symbol of healing, and a symbol of hope. To be born dead center here, right next to the Hopis, was just a big clue that I gave myself, you know? Because all you have to do is bend those edges, and what do you have? You have a swastika. Anyway, um, so there are, are several levels that we can consider this. First is the personal level. Some people have said, so what does that mean that you identify as fae? Well, I don't know. It may not mean much to anybody except to me, okay? But it also means that I can, I can identify and interpret these signs as I see them because, because of the hints that I gave myself as we, as we went along. There is, uh, that will be episode two. It's going to be all about the fae. Um, all kinds of words that you come across, whether they're spelled F-E or P-H-E or uh, F-A-E. There are stories that go back to the original Fay. One of them is an Irish story that I just came across. Somebody, somebody contacted me and said, there's a story I have to tell you that most people don't even actually hold in their consciousness. It's an ancient Irish tale, of course. Um, and it's the Battle of Moitura is the name of it. And it describes a landing. It describes the Tua de Dan Tua Ha de Danan. If you're into into megaliths or you're into Irish culture or you're into ancient peoples and druids and things like that, then that name probably means something to you, but they are considered to be some of the original uh, uh, um, settlers of, of Ireland. And then the, this particular story talks about a um, people, I guess, a race, let's call them a race, that either comes from under the sea or over the sea called the Fomor. And in this oral history, which you can actually hear 
Uh, if you go to YouTube, Megalithomania, Megalithomania 2009, there's a fellow called Robin Williamson who does that tale over the course of about an hour. Well worth listening to. The oral histories are the only ones you can trust now, guys. I promise you. Yeah. The oral histories, those that have been passed down for millennia. Anyway, he does it. It takes about an hour to listen to. And he talks about this race that either comes across the sea or from under the sea. They have one arm, one eye, and one leg, okay? And the way it's described in the tale is it's one eye to covet with, one arm with which to grasp and one leg with which to trample. Now, if you're not talking about an invading predator in, in that description, I don't know what you're talking about. For me, that's an original seed story with the Tuaha de Danon and a description of the landing of the predator or perhaps the infection, the archontic infection on this planet. So it's really well worth a listen. And I will try to analyze that story as best I can right now for the second episode. Now, um, the Fae go to all of the tales of, for example, the white women. There are tales in Portugal, Spain, you know, all the Latin American countries talk about the white women, the women in white. Okay, let's, talk, let's, let's call it the women in white, because if I say white women, I think that might be a little bit misleading. The Catholic Church turned that, took that over and ter turned those into stories of sightings of Mary. Okay, when we talk about the Fae, we often are talking about the Divine Feminine. I, I don't have a, a good enough grasp on how the Divine Masculine comes into this, but I will, I promise you, because it's coming to me and it's coming through me and I'm being led to these places that we can call confirmation that all of us at large can look at and say, ah, yeah, okay, that's confirmation. I get that, okay? Um, anything with a PHE, all right, phenomenon or fairy, obviously, we've been talking about that. In fact, I, I have been and I will continue to be reduced to talking about this, this negative entity that landed and the positive entity that was the fae as the good fairies and the bad fairies. I, I do that because that's how we, that's how it's come to us. Um, in Both of them seem to have... I don't quite know how to put this. Okay, so my concept of the Fey early on was largely the elementals. Yeah. That's what I remember. That's my connection. Right. right. The elementals back in a time when I lived in a place that was very connected and close to nature. Those were entities that I understood as a child. Randy, you just gave it. Oh, keep going. <laughs> and yet at the same time, you have, you have the, the predator which also has assimilated itself into some elemental form because of the black goo, the, um, the dispersion of this negative energetic into our, our system, our, our, our global system, and even yeah. our bodies. So we're dealing with things that are operating on micro and macro levels. That's where yes. I'm with that. Indeed. And actually, while you were speaking, it just clued me in. I mean, you know how that happens, right? People, will, when you're talking about something with someone, you go, oh, there it is. For me, the Fae are both things. They are deeply connected to this planet in ways we don't, that are so deep there are no words for them. And they also have a planet of their own, and I think that they still exist there. Uh, I think they still exist there. Okay. These are my thoughts. I await proof one way or the other. However, do you know, when, I, when you were just talking just now, talking about the elementals and those things that were deeply connected with the earth, I believe that there are still fae on the planet and there are those who have become part of the planet entered into the planet yeah. and if you want to know perhaps something of a spun story but maybe not of the fae on this planet what happened to them it's part of lord of the rings it it's part of that that deal it really is and when they talk about going into the west and diminishing they're really in for me, my heart says that that's the Fae becoming part of literally becoming part of this planet. They are being brought, they're being brought 
to a modern consciousness now because of the threat. Like you said, um, there's a there's a, there's there's this squabbling going on over this planet by various races that are not the original seed race. They have tales that would make us believe that that's the case, right? But it's not true. It's not true. And again, this could be another reason why the chems are being put into the air. Maybe something, someone is returning. Maybe there are, you know, people say it's the Anunnaki, but is it? I don't know. You know, it, what if it's the Fae coming back? I don't know, but something, there's something, everything that has to do with chemtrails is about hiding or dumbing us down and making it, dumbing us down, drugging us. I, that's a better way to put it, drugging us such that we are unaware and unable and things like that. So this is when you were talking about the elementals, it, it helps me come up with some ways to describe what I'm trying to say, which is that some of the Fae are part of this earth. And frankly, that's where I resonate. And you just said that's where you resonate, which is why it was very difficult for me to describe what I was trying to say, because, because what I'm trying to say is they are so, they are so part of this planet and so connected to this planet it's almost like they just became symbi it's symbiosis in a way. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that I've spoken with over the years who have paranormal, whether you call them ET, UFO experiences or whatever, also seem to have these weird synchronicities of occurrence of yeah. these elemental beings. Yeah. Some of them good. Some, I mean, that's where we get the concept of the trolls, not the internet ones, but right. uh, there are numerous elemental entities that seem to operate in the same sphere as these paranormal occurrences go. So I don't know, somewhere in all of that, there's, there's a connection. Yeah. Faye always felt right. And when yeah. anybody discusses them and this is not the first conversation I've had about it, but you've developed it much, much higher than anybody I've spoken with about it before. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a touchstone. It's like something in here that just goes, you know, you yeah. sense, you feel it. this appears to be the ultimately the job that I'm supposed to be doing. It goes to the Fae. This is what I've I this is why when this this bit was being translated for me from this fellow in Germany, I, I literally wept because it was every clue that I'd left myself. And I thought, there it is. That's, I mean, I personally don't need any more proof that I've, that I'm not, that this is, this is for real. You know, this is absolutely for real. And this is why I feel so connected with it. But I'll tell you another one. And this is, do you feel it? You probably already feel a shiver going up your back. Cause I just felt it. Um, when my house burned down, I lived on temple street. Okay. That's I lived on Temple. Yeah, I know. It was on Temple Street. Yeah. When my baby brother died, and that was, I think, not supposed to happen. I think that was something that shouldn't have happened. Oh, my kids are just saying happy birth, happy Mother's Day in the corner. Sorry. Um, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Um, okay. My baby brother died in 1993, and he lived on Temple Street when he died in, a, in Colorado, not in Maine. I mean, the odds there are astronomical, if you ask me. So in 2012, my house on Temple Street burnt down. Within a week or so after its burning, someone said to me that Rudolf Steiner had said, when the temple burns, the door to Ephesus opens. There it goes. You feel it? That's E-P-H-E-S-U-S. Uh, it means Ephesus, the, uh, the, that was actually the mystery school. The mystery yes. school. Uh, yes. The book of Ephesians in the New Testament actually is the letter that was written by Paul to that church that was established there. Yes, it's the mystery school that has to do with the Fae, P-H-E. And E in Germany means I. It's the I, Fae, Aus. Oscar thinks it's Aus instead of us. I come, I come from the Fae. To me, that's what that means. Ephesus. It's also the mystery school of the Fae. When the temple burns, the door to Ephesus opens. That was my message four years ago. I don't know what the hell that meant. 
all I knew is, is, is I knew uh, I needed to keep that kind of thing close to me when it came to me because it was just too weird to let go of and too random, it seemed like. You know, it looks like I'm being side lit. Are you okay with that or should I fix it? Yeah, okay. I light, light shifts in these rooms as we're doing. We're not using green screens. This is in the studio. This is two people <laughs> in their homes having conversations. Yeah, so the door to Ephesus opened, and there you have it. And, um, and you know, that just about brings me to tears right now, thinking about that. That, for me, was the, if the Fay Mystery School. For me, you're about to, it's not... Yeah, it's not the only mystery school that I've been associated with, but that, that particular one is where I'm at right now. So anyway, um, and also there's a, a Faye goes with the word or a lot, which is a word I love. As you know, it means the original, original of the original, original. And there is a town near Magdeburg in eastern, what used to be eastern Germany, which means the city of the woman called or Faye. U-R-F-E-Y. Okay, it's mentioned, this guy, uh, Lanban mentions it. And I'm lucky enough as well that uh, Josh was just in Frankfurt and he looked the guy up, he found him, he's like 85. And in August, I'm gonna go interview him in English. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll have that. And um, boy, are we gonna talk about the Fae, you know? I think this, I think what you've opened up is probably, um, on a mythological level, uh, one of the keys to understanding not only who we are, but what's been going on on the planet, how, right. why we've been suppressed, and the nature of the Fae versus the nature of numerous other predatory uh, races that have passed through here. Mm -hmm. And you and I talked about this in a certain context. Uh, now you're going, there you go. I was going to say, now you're going robo, which always means that we're onto something. No, no, no. It, it, we're basically, <laughs> we're reenacting old wars with a race memory. Right. You know, going back, yeah. and I'll just say it. It was when we were discussing Simon Parks. And the yeah, fact do it. that there is a certain animus that occurs with people who are, let's say, of the Fae, and people who come from mantid or reptilian backgrounds. Right, right. Because we understand something internally that there is this root race war that's gone on for a long time. Right. And probably is still going on in some dimension that we can't, you know, yeah. which is, a, and, and it's, it's not even astral, it's beyond that. It's a completely different dimension. We are talking to each other on that dimension. We are engaging in uh, battles in some way that probably have nothing to do with a sword and a, and a pistol, but um, we are engaged in a battle on some level with all of these, uh, what would you call them? I want to call them entities, but, but, but at, at that level, they're not even corporeal really in the way that we understand corporate well, you know. intelligence. There is, yeah. um, yeah. What do you call it? Um, we're, we're dealing with, well, because we ourselves are multidimensional. That's one of the great suppressions of all of this is that most people don't recognize that we operate on a multidimensional level. Right. And at a given right. time, we are multidimensional beings operating on multiple timelines and multiple streams of reality because time begins to break down once you move out of the 3D, 4D realm. Right, right. You know, um, some of the other clues that I got, uh, I'm not going to be able to do them justice here because I really need to write it as an episode. Although you can read an article that we translated uh, from Lundman on Vortex. It's called the women of Faye. And I sent you a link, Randy, if you want to, if you want to look at it. Um, but that was kind of the beginning of the translations that started coming to me. Uh, Vortexcourage.me. Go look for the women of Faye. You can read some of what Lundman has already talked about and also Yashka's on to something with him um, because Landman has access to old high German which you have to be old enough and you have to have a, a real understanding of German to, to have any access to old high German or, or what things stand for or any of that but Landman can read the glyphs he can read the Mayan glyphs he can he, and he can show you 
she can show you where the old high German words are. You just swerved into something I've wondered about. We can, yeah. these glyphs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at look at Tolkien. When I studied Tolkien in, in a literary class. I studied the stories, but I studied the glyphic expressions and the maps that he had in the, yeah. those didn't feel to me like so much a contrivance as rather a transference of something that was very ancient. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's the thing. And it's not very popular to say, but uh, some version of old high German really is the Ur language. And, people wrote all over these buildings, the Mayans or whoever it was, all over the planet in Old High German. And Landman was given the ability to read these, and he will give lectures. If you speak German, you can watch him. Um, he's a terrible lecturer because he's, <laughs> he's just an old IT guy, you know, with the pocket protector and the, and the hair and the, you know, being very, you know, bombastic about stuff that's really just... Um, yeah, it's like a class watching him that you really didn't want to take. But you know, what I, you know what I mean? But he's there. He's doing it. If you understand German, you can watch him do it yourself. He's on YouTube. Um, and they're very, very old. He's, he was doing this uh, in the 70s, I think, or the 80s. He put a couple of books out in German in the 80s that Yashka's busy translating right now. And um, he's not well. He's not well. Um, that's one of the reasons we want to get over there and, and talk to him and film him and ask him some really pointed questions about the Fay and other things. Because he was given a bunch of information and everybody thought he was a lunatic and nobody listened to him. And you know the story. Yeah. And he's about to pass, uh, pass away. I hope not. Yash is treating him. So anyway, um, what was that about? Remind me. Oh, the Mayan glyphs. Yeah. yeah. So, so speaking of glyphs and all of those things, you know, again, we are, we are engaged. We are engaged with others, other species and other dimensions right now. And I often think that this is what happened with me and my former writing partner, because he openly declared himself to be Draco, absolutely self self identified as Draco. Okay, that really didn't bother me too much because I see Ike as Draco. I see all kinds of people around who have all kinds of um, connections to these things. Doesn't necessarily mean they're dangerous, bad, or anything else. It just is what it is. But yeah, he self identified as Draco. As a matter of fact, it was on that same trip. How do you like that? That I just described to Berlin. And so as we went through the process of writing this book, which is absolute truth, as far as to the best of my knowledge right now, that book is absolute truth. He really dragged his heels on translating it into German. We finally ended up having to hire someone else to, to finish translating it because he just couldn't get around to doing it. And he wanted us to add a chapter about how in the end, he goes, he said, how, how hard would it be to pull it off the English market so that we could add this chapter? Well, I can't do that. I can't do that, Harold. Why? Well, this chapter turns out to be, uh, the subject turns out to be how we needed to, all we really needed to do was realize that evil had won. And that if we would just surrender to the idea that evil had won, then everything would be much better, go much better for us. And that there were a couple of extraterrestrial entities poised out there, ready to help us with that. And uh, it was, the yeah. Program. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was one of those things where he had invited them into his internal being and they were living there okay so no obviously I wasn't about to allow that chapter to be put into English I don't know if it's there in the German version I have no idea um, and my my German publisher is really bollocks about telling me what's going on so um, anyway so there was that and then he wouldn't he, he just dragged his dragged his feet about translating it and then there was this, this, in the end, there was this thing of, of him just sort of walking off into the sunset, when, especially when I called him, called him on this idea that he was saying he was possessed. Okay, so what I'm getting at with all of this is that perhaps there was an assignment there. Perhaps he was assigned to watch this process unfold, to try to stop it, to try to stick his foot out, to do whatever, 
while not really being able to keep the information from going out there, he could at least try to just slow it down or, or uh, taint it in the end or whatever. But then he just kind of disappeared. Uh, you know, I need to ask since we went into this drift, uh, yeah. talking about Harold for a minute, the research on black goo, or we, 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 we have to kind of stand by that. I mean, he did good empirical work. Which was, he did. It was true. You know, and I know other people uh, have tried to drag me into this because my interview with Harold was done sort of mm -hmm. the, the, the crossroads of this whole event when right, you know, right. you're falling apart. And quite yeah. frankly, that interview, while it's valuable, kind of as it went on, and it went on for two, over two hours, um, sure. started, you know, it, it just started to fall apart because yeah. the narrative was trying to grab something and pull it in that I wasn't letting. It was an energetic battle between Harold and I towards yeah. the end of that interview. Yeah, yeah. And that had happened actually a few times. Um, we did this thing called the Untangled Gathering. Six or eight of us got, Danny, yeah, got put yeah. together. Do you remember that with Danny Arnold and uh, Lisa Harrison? And I was only there for two and a half hours. And then I had to, it was a four hour live thing. And I had to, I had to leave after two and a half hours. Well, not too long ago, Danny told me that they had invited Harold for an interview. But after I left, they saw a part of Harold that they hadn't seen while I was there. And they decided to uninvite him. I find, you see, nobody said that to me at the time, for, I guess for obvious reasons, thinking that we're working together, you know. But uh, I had no idea that that was well, that, so. You know, from my standpoint, Kara, you and Harold came along at a point when I had been down this road of the Archons for almost two years. Yeah. I had been working with a writer named Robert Stanley here in the United States. Yeah, I know who that is. Bringing out this information on the Archons because one day I called Robert Stanley up and I said, it's time for us to do this. I need to talk to you. I need to know what you know and some right. research because something is pulling me into this. I fought it. Yeah. So we went down that road because I knew at that point there was something opening in terms mm -hmm. of what needed to come out. The black goo came along almost immediately in succession and we're yeah. going, well, and, and I've gone back since we, we found all of this referential material that right. indicates that yeah this stuff's been around for a long time yeah 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 knew about it um, yeah. so it was important to bring this out it's also important to disengage personalities sometimes from the research mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. not get married to one side and understand right. that people are flawed and then on top of that we have this ancient race war that goes on within us because of who we are Exactly, you know, exactly. Resonance patterns yeah. that come from our own galactic genetics. Yeah, and for all we know, Harold was trying to bust out of that. Do you know? And got and got slammed back down. We don't know. And we'll never know at this point. Or maybe someday. But the reality is his research on black goo is absolutely valid. There's no question about that. Yeah. And in terms of the validity, and, and, and I want to mention Robert Stanley again in a minute, but in terms of the, the validity of the black goo, I personally know that it's valid because my mother gave me, it's in the sun thief. I did not know that. Did I tell you that? I wrote that into the sun thief without realizing what I was doing. Okay. She, I wrote, I wrote every vision that came to me about that book during the time that I was writing it. And there was a period of time. I don't know. Maybe have we covered this already? Maybe not. Um, there was a period of time when uh, there was a vision where she was sitting in an office building. This is in the Sun Thief. She was sitting somewhere, I would assume Virginia, based on the way the office looked in terms of military break room kind of thing. You know, there was a long table. There was a sink. There was a fridge. It wasn't very fancy, that kind of thing. And she had a clipboard in front of her, like a yellow notepad. I could not see what was on it, but I could see that was written across the top was top secret. She was smoking a cigarette, which she never did. She was chewing on a Brock's caramel, which she never never would have done ever neither one of those things would she ever have done and while she was sitting there she said i tried to stop them and i don't know what that means to this day okay um and then as i was looking this and then in this vision 
up through the sink and down across the walls comes this greenish viscous fluid and it starts to fill the room. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I could only describe that when I was looking at it as the same viscosity and sort of the same color as, as, uh, um, antifreeze. Okay. It was like that. Okay. Again, this was in the book. I had no idea that I was talking about black goo. I was talking about sentient oil at that point. She put that in there for us. So that's the number one reason I know it's for real. The other reason I know it's for real is, um, I was talking to, I, I was watching uh, David Griffith on the basis. Have you seen his sort of, you know, a hundred mile an hour spiel on the black goo and how that ended up uh, being part of an incident in the Gulf and the fact that the Gulf uh, oil incident was really about black goo and all of that sort of thing. Since I told you when the Gulf oil incident occurred, I prophetically projected that into it and didn't even know it at the time. That's on yeah. my website at yeah. the flushing floor that people can look at that. Yes, of course. So we have talked about this. Yeah, so but the day that the French sub surfaced with dead sold dead sailors on it was the day my mother died. It was 7-Eleven. And anytime I go to 7-Eleven, that is my mom telling me that it is absolutely for real. You listen and you pay attention anytime I get a 7-Eleven. Okay, so, I mean, so yes, it, we're talking about Harold. Yes, absolutely. His research on the black goo, his research that's in that book is absolutely spot on. It's still a Cracker Jack book, but the struggle, whatever the struggle was, whatever ends up being, whatever's driving the man, you know, um, I've been told that by someone who looked at him, somebody who's very talented, uh, clairvoyant and healer, who had Harold right in front of her, told him to his face, the only thing that's keeping you alive right now is the fluid in your spine. You're a, you are like a dead man walking right now. So, you know, something's in there, and I don't even know what's left of Harold, okay? Yeah. Regardless, so no, and, and it was that's okay because we put the clarification on the record because most yeah. people know I did not engage this. I didn't choose Kara over Harold. I oh God, no! Uh, mainly because I didn't have all the details, and I wanted to flesh some of that out. But you right. you've chosen to do it in this interview. I don't even know where he is. I mean, no one knows where he is. He's disappeared. Yeah, our German publisher doesn't know where. It hasn't heard from him in months. So I don't know. He was on the same panel with Miles uh, in November in Poland making speeches. He said, Miles, I want to go after you because a lot of what you're saying is wrong and I want to fix it. <laughs> Miles really thought that was astonishing. What Miles saying is <laughs> huh? like, I can't. It's all research. I mean, we're just basically, I well, I'm, I have a platform. You're part of the platform. Yeah, uh, yeah. Know. I don't have an agenda for most of this. Yeah. But I want to go ahead. go ahead. The whole thing makes me really sad because honestly, on some level, Harold and I were really, really good friends. We had all kinds of very deep conversations. Okay. And again, that could be part of this. We don't consciously know what's going on on the dimensions where we're really communicating, where we're at battling it out, all of those sorts of things. Anyway, go ahead, please back into the Fey a little bit and I want to develop um, what you think right. in terms of the Fey's interaction with humanity um, we have these legends that are built I mean those who subscribe to the classic theory of the Anunnaki or the reptilians depending on your perspective believe that those are progenitors that we were spawn of alien races so where in all of that and the continuum does the faith faith come in uh you've called them i believe the originals the um i call them the original seed race and until somebody proves me wrong i'm going to maintain that that's the case and i maintain that's the case because on the basis of irish on very ancient irish folktales and frankly on the swastika being so deeply connected with where they come from and our planet Okay, and 
there is this whole lore part of the Fae, which was so beautifully brought to consciousness by J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Um, This is, uh, yeah. So, yes, I consider them to be the original seed race. Now, I will speak to, I will tell you what I think about um, this Anunnaki stuff. Uh, Landman just, just, um, took that word apart and I can't remember what he came up with, but it's, it's a word. It's not a name of a people. It's a word that describes a people. Okay. This is what happens with words. You know, if you want to conquer a race, you take their primary language and exactly you right. yes. mess with it, uh, which is very much what has happened to English. Um, it's, it's harder to screw with German because it's very straightforward and very, yeah. you know, to the point. Um, Anyway, so, but, but this is Sitchin's work and I don't subscribe to Sitchin's work. You know, I don't, I don't, I think it's one of those tales that was concocted to really make us feel disempowered because it's almost like, well, here's the story. They took your battery out. So you got nothing to work with. Sorry, sucks to be you. I mean, that's really the bottom line on that story. And I, I refuse. I, I do not consent to that. It is, it's not what happened. It's not okay. I'm far more into George Kavasilis's evaluation of who we are as entities. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to listen to him because it's, it's complex and he's got it down. However, um, no, I don't buy into fiction stuff, which means I don't buy into the Anunnaki in the way that he presents them. Okay. Um, there's always a grain of truth to everything because if there weren't truth, if you don't have, if you don't park the truth somewhere, you, the lie can't live. And that's just black magic. And that's just one of the only things Simon Parks ever said that I repeat, which is if you can't, you've got to park the truth. They've got to tell you what they've done. Otherwise the black magic doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, that, that's old uh, Masonic lore. I mean, we've it's old stuff. Anybody that's a researcher knows. Yeah, it's old stuff. So in terms of who the Fae are, it very much is a, a, a case of, and I don't have this clear in my mind yet, but do you know that the, do you know the, um, the tales of the she where there was a race that mixed with another race and there was a, an interstellar race that mixed with a race that was here. And I don't know if those were the original Fae and somebody came in or what, but there, I believe my, my belief is that we are mixed with an interstellar race. I don't necessarily, it, it is not natural that we are mixed with any reptile or any of those sorts of things. Although it may have been done to us um, in labs somewhere, who knows, but um in terms of our inner interstellar interracial breeding, if you were, I think we're all mixed with the Fae mm. or some dilution of the Fae as we've gone through time. I also think that the survivors of Atlantis, of Atlantis were in fact Fae and, and clearly uh, much closer to an original kind of Fae. And I also believe that all of the battles on this planet um, from the word go, from the very first bloodletting, giant blood sacrifice, are really one long battle. It is a tale of one long chase. The bad fairies chasing the good fairies, trying to destroy them. The good fairies running, 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 building these monuments, they're not monuments, but cities and and temples and all of these things where we look at them and we go, who the hell could have built that? Because you can't do it with stone tools. You couldn't have done it with medieval artisans. You know, it's just not possible. This is the Fae. This is the Atlantis, survivors of of Atlantis. And um, it's all one galactic cosmic arc of a battle between the bad guys and the good guys trying to get rid of of um, this amazing, this amazing uh, race of people who knew about, okay, this is another reason why I say the Fae sort of, I don't want to say diminished because that's not really what I mean, even though that's what Tolkien said. They, 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 they merged in a way with this planet and they understood this planet in ways that 
that the bad fairies, if you will, are trying to divorce us from. They knew how to raise a 10 billion ton rock to the top of a pyramid through the air. And just all of these ways that we use the planet that we have been taught in 20th century are prehistoric. You know, we don't look at the rocks as technology. Again, we're back dealing with timelines that are completely distorted. Yeah. And we don't look at rocks as technology. We look at people who work with rocks as, uh, you know, ignorant and savage and all of those things we've been taught to see. Whereas no, 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 no. I, in, from my perspective, the rocks themselves are elements. I mean, exactly. We exactly. Know, I'm not looking at our planet. You know, one of the arrogance of humanity, Kara, is we look at everything else as extensions of our utility. So rocks, sticks, wood, all of these materials are just raw material for an imagination that we're building something rather than understand there is a living organic essence to all of this, to the rocks. Anybody who's worked with crystals knows the energetics yeah. that in yeah. play. Anybody who has ever walked ancient ruins, walked in, even just go out to Sedona and walk among the stones there, or wherever mm -hmm. there are megalithic sites, the energy there tells you that there's something old, something very wise, and something very living in yeah. those rocks. Yes. And I think that the fae are, the fae that you and I connect with, which is the, the fae that's within the context of, of the material matter and the essence of this planet are rising. They're rising to uh, uh, being, they're being reawakened to a more modern consciousness because they are needed. They need to separate. And there are stories so that they can work in a different way. And there are, there, there are philosophers, lots of them, but, but one of my primary my, my favorite philosophers was a 20th century fellow called Owen Barfield. You may know that name, Owen Barfield. Um, he wrote this terrific book called Saving the Appearances. And he was uh, not just a friend of, Ste of Tolkien's, but he was a, a friend of Steiner's. So he connects those two in a way. And he talks about a time when we were all we could all live into everything that was around us. We, we really didn't separate ourselves from yeah. that which is around yeah. us. We could feel, yeah, we felt our way into everything. And then there was a time when we separated off from that because we needed to do that. We needed to become separate entities. Um, and now we are coming, we're, we're forging a sort of combination of those two things. So, when I try to describe what the Fey are doing by coming back out of the consciousness of this planet to a more uh, able way of working with us in our material on our material plane, I know my friend Maria Wheatley has seen them come up out of the ground under trees. They're deeply connected to trees and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's um, experience as well. yeah, they are deeply connected to the trees and the trees are alive. The trees talk to each other, the trees, this, the trees, that, which is another thing Tolkien talked about. He talked about the ants the and ants, how they're conscious. Yeah. And, and yes. I was told in, I was in California in 2009 sat at a lunch meeting with a, with a guy out there who was sort of a shaman who told me that in the coming war, one of the things that would happen was the trees would begin to work with us. They would hide yes. us. They would perfect. Well, that, and I thought about it later and I thought, well, that's completely right out of Tolkien, but yes. it's all out, also out of ancient legend. And what is one of the things, the primary things that chemtrails are killing? Trees. Vegetation, but you look at the trees right now. That's a tree consciousness. It's, it's not a byproduct. It's not a, oops, the trees are going. It's definite, deliberate, you know. There's well, they so much are the antenna system of the planet. They are the way in which energetic messages are transmitted subterraneously up to the air itself. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's a tragedy to watch this. Listen, we got just a couple of minutes here and I, yeah. I, I want you to get out what you want to get out. So I want to give you some space here. Put okay. out your most, you know, whatever you want to be heard. Okay. What I want, what I want, what do I most want to be heard? What I most want to be heard is how connected it all is. Okay. I know that, um, 
as I was going through the last four or five years as an activist, I would often be puzzled when I would see people go from one thing to another. Like for example, for example, um, Sophia Smallstorm, who used to be, who taught me a lot about transhumanism and chemtrails and all of that, has moved along a path. And I wondered why that would happen. Why, how is it that one leaves, it appears to leave a path, but the reality is, is we're not leaving a path. We're walking the same path. It all goes to the same thing. So for example, in two weeks time, I've been invited to come to Vienna to talk about um, child abuse. And you might wonder what, what the heck is she being invited to talk about child abuse for? And that comes directly from uh, dangerous imagination, silent assimilation. It is about how the predator has kidnapped us, kidnapped our certain, certainly kidnapped our children. And I'm going to speak at this conference amongst speakers and people who are there to hear about child abduction. So isn't it interesting to see how these things all come together? It's all of a piece. Everything that's happening to us on this planet that's coming to us via the predator is all of a piece. It's all one long campaign that began with the first big bloodletting Okay, because they feed on the, this is the archons. You know, you talked about Robert Stanley. I just saw him for the first time the other day. He's talking about the archons being, um, about what? Being like um, amoebas? Mm -hmm. Did he, and, and getting into us in that way? And that you can't, for example, buy an infrared, you, you can't take pictures in the infrared. That filter is disabled on any camera that you buy. Because if we were taking pictures in the infrared, we would see things we didn't like. Well, I grew up in the era of film cameras when you could buy infrared film. The fact is, ah. you can, through firmware upgrades, actually ah, restore that function see. back into digital cameras. You have to find yeah. the right hacker. This yeah. is important because, again, certain spectrum are being disallowed to us via the right. transformation of our senses. Yep, and via the changes in the plasma around us, which changes the way we can see. That's Victor Schauberger. That's Schauberger. Okay, so see how chemtrails goes to child abduction, goes to um, the fae returning. Goes to, it's all of a piece, and we can't know the truth until we identify the lie. Okay, that's why those some of us are bringing you um, this kind of thing, like the false history. And because I know that most of the people on this planet don't want to read 2000 pages of Anatoly Fomenko's beautiful, brilliant work. I've tried to put it into 50 or 60 pages so that you can get a handle on it and you can go with it wherever you want to go, you know, and it will create these paths in your brain and your understanding and your heart, your mind, and you will have knowings and you will have epiphanies and all of the things that you are supposed to have on your path. That's what this is about. Okay. You are, you are playing a big part of, of, of your big part of the piece, a big piece of the puzzle in getting, you know, getting um, this world restored. I, for one, don't want this. What I, for one, do not want to hand this to my children. Okay. I don't want to hand this crap to my children. I don't even know how much longer they have if we don't fix it. Okay. Because of the poisoning of the air. All right. So it's really, really important that you get on board, that enough of us get on board. Somebody said to me the other day, well, you know, there's a significant portion of, of the population in the United States and elsewhere who will say, yeah, 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 yeah. And go back to, you know, watching the game and eating their Doritos. Yeah. yeah. OK, that's fine. I, we will believe for you until you can believe for yourself. It doesn't matter. You went. You went. I was muted. Okay. The, pivot, the pivot for changing a culture is not the majority. It is somewhere between three and 5% of a given. There you go. Let's go. Let's get them. Let's get them. Actually right now hitting critical mass on this planet. I've had this conversation with a number of people, people who I consider to be sort of my inner counsel. Yeah. I'm all convinced this is the war right now. This is why the chemtrails, why the vaccine, why the autism, why right. are we being stripped biologically, psychologically, spiritually right now? Right, right, right. Because they can't stop what is occurring yeah. on this planet. 
Yeah, and we're going to put a stop to it. So, okay, all of my work is out. I'm going to shamelessly say right now that Randy will probably put a picture and a link up of my latest work. Yep. It's not expensive. It's just an episode. Get it. Join the conversation, okay? Please join the conversation. Let yourself know what the truth is consciously. And the next one that comes out is going to be about the Fae. And I think it's really, really, really important, okay? And maybe when I get back from this child abduction seminar in Deanna, I will knock on Randy's door again because I have a feeling there's a reason I've been invited to this. I mean, that's pretty out there. I know there, is. I know there is, because yeah. I can tell you, Kara, there is an avalanche coming of people who are going to begin to leak out what has been done to them as children. Yeah, yeah. Because we're, like, not, we're not going to let this next generation suffer this. Yeah, and I'll tell you something else. I don't think I've ever said this to you. Maybe I have, but when I was seven and my little brother was five, my mother took us to the University of Oklahoma to participate in some kind of study. Now I'm remembering, I'm trying to remember this. Okay. It's, I am 50, almost 57. So it's been a while, but of course this has always been in my, in my, somewhere in my consciousness. I knew this. And in return for this study, we were going to get free vaccines, whatever that means. I think I came out of there with my smallpox vaccine. I'm not really sure. Anyway, what I was told was that that was actually the U S military starting a, starting a gene splicing study on me. And it was unsuccessful. They could not splice my genes with anything. But I will tell you, Randy, I don't have any, I have no recollection of that year. It's gone. I don't know who my teacher was. I don't know what school I went to. Do you know what I mean? It's just No, I do know what you mean because there's a lot of us that have that. I I put myself in it. Yeah. And I am contacting more and more people where they're contacting me who have similar experiences of lost time. A whole year gone. Interaction with government military agents. Yeah. Um, like I said, this is an avalanche that's occurring because it is. And those memories will come back if they're needed. And yeah, if they're needed and if they're not, they won't. Suppressed. They're suppressed. That's simple. People. Let's face it. Who wants to remember all that? Right, right. Now, and seven is a very important year. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, uh, all I know for sure is that the gene splicing attempts with me were unsuccessful. So that tells me something about the Faye, my relationship to the Faye as well. I don't think, I just think they couldn't do it. That may actually be a key component of the things that they're after. That aspect of us connected to the Faye and how unique we are. Carol, yes. this has been such a wonderful interview. It's good to have you back. Please, Randy. let's not make it so long. No, but you know, you're busy and I'm busy. You're busy. Everybody's it's after your show. Emerging emerging research that, yeah. that is coming. I do. Yeah, wow. I do. And, and when I get the Faye episode done, I will send it to you as soon as it's, as before it's even published. And I probably will um, knock on your door as soon as I'm back from Vienna. Uh, I'll be more red the next time. Well, now that now that the material's coming out. Oh, it's fine. I, I know you uh, you know it in there. But intuitively, I know this is important. You know it in there. You and I connect with each other, and it's been a marvelous conversation. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Out so that- okay, it's www.vortexcourage.me. That's one word. V-O-R-T-E-X-C-O-U-R-A-G-E. I do have an author's page on website, uh, author's page on Facebook. Um, Kara St. Louis, go there. Um, everything you can find, everything on Amazon, even if you live in Canada. I had started a, uh, a place where I was trying to get books the rest of the world where they will only put out Kindle, like Australia. It just it was just bankrupting me. I have to find, uh, but I am on the verge. I'm going to Australia, I hope. It looks like I am uh, at the end of July to lecture in Melbourne and then maybe in Byron Bay. Um, and hopefully I've got somebody who will do a book on demand uh, book for Oceania down there so that you don't have to pay unbelievable postage because Amazon will only get you Kindle. However, if you're down there and you're listening to Randy, you can get it in Kindle. Yeah. I just prefer it in print because you can alter Kindle. Yes. That's yeah. the bottom line. No, the digital right? media can be manipulated. Paris, yeah. Thanks for coming on. We'll be talking again soon, and uh, I know that it's going to be an exciting year for you as you uncover more and more of this. 
This is Off Planet TV. We'll be back with another episode very soon. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep it is. It is. He's such a good guy.